Okay, turn to 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. I'm going to continue the message, the series that we have, The King's Way. And we know that today is Palm Sunday. But hey, let's go with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Not with traditional observance of days. The Holy Spirit is doing this work in our church. It's a work of agape and love. And let's just stick on this. And when we walk in love, practice love, we will be experiencing the triumphant life of Palm Sunday. Hallelujah. So more important than observing days is actually walking in the Word and experiencing the Word in our lives. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. The Bible says, God is love. God is love. Is it up on the screen? He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Everyone say, God is love. The word love there is the word agape. Agape is divine love, supernatural love, unconditional love. It's a love that cannot be expressed by the greatest love songs or the greatest poems that men may conceive. It is not a love like the Taj Mahal. It is not a love like Romeo and Juliet. It's love that is completely pure for the benefit, for the benefit of the receiver, not the giver. It's unconditional. That means it is not based on any conditions of race, looks, worth, merit of the other person. And that love can only come from God Himself, expressed to us through the cross. Now, the most powerful expression of this love is the forgiveness of our sins. The forgiveness of our sins, which we have received in Jesus Christ. Now, I want to start with highlighting a little bit about forgiveness in a practical way. Because last Sunday, when we had in the evening a time of prayer, there was a time of forgiveness that the Lord led the staff to do towards the whole congregation. That if for some reason we have offended you by our words, our actions, that we had asked forgiveness from the people that were present, it was a very powerful moment of healing, a very powerful moment of restoration. And out of that came two or three more days of healing that the Lord did in the hearts of many of the people who came. See, you missed it, some of you. A lot of deliverance, a lot of healing in the hearts. And then on the last night, on Thursday, there was a lot of victory. And we believe that we are actually in that moment, we are experiencing the breakthroughs of that moment of prayer. But I want to really give some practical understanding of what forgiveness should be when we are practicing it. All right? Now, before I talk about forgiveness and how we practice, let's just be reminded, go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. So, the most powerful expression of the love of God is the forgiveness of our sins. Let's be reminded what it is. Forgiveness of our sins is through Jesus Christ. It is by the payment of the blood. It's a generous forgiveness. It is a gift, which means we did not buy it or earn it. Again, it is complete forgiveness. It is total forgiveness. Past sins, present sins, and future sins. And it is unconditional forgiveness. It is not dependent on good works. It is not because you got water baptized, you gave to the church, or you confessed all your sins. Even before you confessed, you were forgiven on the cross. Can you say Amen? Now turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Why the king's way is important, walking in love, and by that we will be doing a lot of forgiveness to one another. Ephesians 4, 32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Everyone say, forgiving one another. Forgiving one another, how? How do I forgive? Many Christians have this question. How do I forgive? He has hurt me so much. He abused me so much. How do I forgive? I still have so much anger and hatred in my heart. 
The Bible says how? In the same way as God in Christ forgave you. In the same way as Christ forgave you. So how was that? It's by grace. They don't have to ask forgiveness. They don't have to prove themselves to you. Secondly, forgive completely, forgive totally. Do not bring up the same issue again. How? Forgive as a gift. Forgive through the generosity that you have received from Christ Himself. Now why it's important to first be reminded of how God forgave me is because the ability to forgive others can come only when I am reminded how much I have been forgiven. How much you have been forgiven. Amen. We love because He first loved us. Our ability to love is when we are reminded how much we are loved. Our ability to forgive is when we are reminded how much we have been forgiven. Can you say Amen? Hallelujah. So forgiveness is giving up your rights to your justice. Giving up your rights to condemn and to blame and to accuse. Giving up your rights. For whatever people may have done, you have the right to point a finger at them and say you were wrong. But surrender that to the Lord. Because when Jesus died for your sins, and He took the penalty of your own judgment and condemnation on Himself, that means we no longer have the right to demand justice. Now, I'm not talking about in the worldly governmental sense. There's still justice there. I'm talking about your relationship with one another. I'm talking about in the kingdom. Can you say Amen? Hallelujah. Giving up your right for offense. Okay? Now, forgiveness must be practiced in the right context and in the right scope. Alright? So let me just explain a little bit of that. I cannot ask you forgiveness for what I did not do and what is not my responsibility. I really need to touch this because of what we did on Sunday night. So, but I'm sure all of you will understand, all right? I cannot ask forgiveness for what I did not do and for what is not my responsibility. I'm responsible only for what I have done and what I have caused in people's lives. For example, because this is a church scenario, let me take church examples. Many times as leaders, we select some people to be on certain teams, to be on the stage, to come and share testimony, or to be leaders. That's our responsibility. So what we do is we pray, we seek God, and we also discuss among the leaders. Now understand, as leaders, our first responsibility is to God. It's not to you. My first responsibility is not to you, alright? It's to God. That means my job is to seek God and to obey Him. Why this is important to understand is this. Many people also want to serve God. They want to be selected. Some have genuine desires to be a leader. There's nothing wrong with that. Peter, James, and John, all of them wanted to be leaders. There's nothing wrong in that. However, what we have seen is that sometimes when we choose narrow, but we did not choose Imli and Temse. I'm sorry, I just, those, just those names came, all right? I'm not targeting any tribe. <laughs> Sometimes when we choose one and we did not choose the other two, the other two get offended. And they start thinking, Pastor ignored me. I was rejected. And then they get offended. And some of them stop coming to church. And they hold that grudge in their heart. And then after two years, they come and say, See, you did not select me. I was very hurt with you. But I forgave you. This kind of scenarios happen all the time. Now let me explain this very well. In such cases, I or any of the staff or church leaders do not have to apologize to anyone. We don't have to apologize, no matter how offended you were. Now, this will help you in all your churches, wherever you are in life also. Try to understand this, all right? No matter how offended you became, I do not need to apologize. That's something you need to deal with God in your own heart. It's God who selects, it's not us. We seek God the best way we can. Alright, did you understand that? Now, for my own story, let me explain. Some time passed, I was not invited to speak in some conferences by my own friends. They were organizing, I felt ignored, I felt reject rejected, insulted. 
So the enemy took advantage of that and began to whisper thoughts and feelings into my heart. He is jealous of you. He doesn't want you to succeed. They don't deserve your gift. All those thoughts and feelings came. I felt offended. My pride was hurt. And I began to have imaginary hurts. Imaginary hurts because I was only imagining. Imaginary hurts. It resulted from my own assumptions and my own thoughts. This is where the enemy, the enemy works. This is where Satan is an expert. Because even the whisper, the first whisper to Adam and Eve from Satan was, God does not love you. God doesn't want you to prosper. God doesn't want you to be powerful. But if you eat this, you will become like him. So in the whispers of your heart and mind, always be careful whether it's the enemy that you are listening to. So the Lord spoke to me and said, if someone invites you for a conference or a crusade, it is because I have put my name in their hearts. If they did not invite you, it's because I did not put your name in their hearts. Did you get it? So instead of blaming people, instead of blaming them and getting hurt, don't you think that I am big enough to put your name in the hearts of people so they'll invite you and speak in conferences, open doors for you? When he wants to use me, God said, don't you think I can put my name in the hearts of people? And when I don't want to use you, then I don't have to put your name in their hearts. Now that set me free. It set me free from my own assumptions, my hurts, and it set me free to love my friends without putting any manipulation or expectations on them. See, when we are practicing agape, love, human love is usually selfish. In fact, most human love, or let us say, all human love is self-directed. Whether it's for glory, power, self-gain, or something in the end. There's always a hook attached. There's always strings attached to all human loves. But agape love has no strings attached. Jesus died on the cross knowing fully well that some of you would reject him and not accept him. But they still died for us on the cross. There is freedom in agape. It frees you to make your own choices to be who you are. So God set me free in my heart to be relating with my friends without putting any demands or expectations on them that if I invite you, you also invite me. If I give you, then you must also give to me. That is selfish, manipulative love. It binds instead of setting people free. Is that helping anyone? Some years back, one person got really offended with me because I was not teaching in the church about the end times. He was so mad. He said, I'm leaving the church. I said, you are free to do as you choose. But I'm not going to apologize for not preaching what you want me to preach. I'm not obligated to. Because my first responsibility is to God. Amen. So, what I'm talking about is boundaries. Boundaries in your emotions and thoughts and in our responsibilities. What is my responsibility? What is your responsibility? Where I end and where you begin. If you will understand boundaries, it will save your life. Another scenario. Many times people have expectations on the church. Expectations that are unreasonable, uncommunicated, and not even biblical. Now, the main responsibility of the pastors of the church is this, to feed you the Word of God. It's not even to visit your home, all right? That's not our main responsibility. If you go by the Bible, it's to feed the Word of God, to lead you as an example into spiritual values and character. Number three, to pray for you. And number four, to challenge you with the vision of God so that together we are achieving great things for the Lord and through that you also change and transform and go higher in your walk with God. I hope you're understanding. Amen. Alright? Now, there are other ministerial responsibilities like marriage and funeral and yes, when you're in problem, we come and visit you in the hospital, crisis, counseling. We do all of that. But economical, 
Financial and physical is not our primary responsibility. Now, many people come to the church and they require, sometimes they ask for money. Sometimes they ask for loans. Sometimes they expect money from the church. And many times we have said no to people. Now, we give to the poor. But we don't want to just give to anyone who asks because it will also mean that they are not being responsible in their own lives. Now, people have gotten offended. And people have walked away. What do we do in such times? It's up to them. We don't apologize for what we believe is from the Word of God. Amen. I hope you're understanding. Yes, boundaries. You have to understand our own responsibility and your own responsibility. In such cases, the church is not responsible for your hurts. When people react, your reaction does not mean that I was wrong. You just chose to react that way. All right? I'm talking about agape. It's a little deeper, more practical, but you will understand. It's not just I love you, but then you're always fighting internally. You have to learn. Agape is a very practical way. It's an art at times. Okay? Some time back, many years back, so don't think it's anyone among my staff right now, but many years back, a couple of staff came and said, you know, Pastor, I feel so afraid to talk to you. That's why I don't talk to you. I feel so afraid to come up and share with you. So the way that it was shared was as if I was at fault, that they were afraid. So I had to communicate to them and say, I am not responsible for your fear. Now, they assumed that since I was so serious on the desk, not smiling and just focusing on my work. Sometimes if you come and see me at home also, if I am studying, if I'm reading, I'm so serious, I don't smile. Right? Now, they assumed that I was angry because I was not smiling. Now, they did not know my heart and my mind. I was also focused on my work. But they assumed I was angry and they were afraid. And they responded in their assumptions by feeling fear towards me and blaming me for the fear they were feeling. So I had to tell them, listen, I'm not responsible for your feelings. I am not responsible for your thoughts. If you choose to respond with fear and insecurity, that's your responsibility. It's not mine. Are you understanding what I'm saying? They chose to assume. You see, many times we are hurt because of our own assumptions. It's not that people has hurt you. So what they said was, you made me feel fear. I did not make you feel anything. You chose to be fearful by your own response. See, no matter what people may do to you, don't ever say, you made me. You made me. Right? People don't have that much power over you unless you choose to give them that power. See, we use this term very frequently in Nagali because we don't have the skills to deal with our emotions. You've not been taught how to protect the heart. People say, things like, you made me feel, you made me feel angry, you made me feel sad. No. People are not responsible for your emotions. Even if they gossiped about you, even if they hurt you, you are responsible for the way you choose to react. Can you say amen? See, your choice is your responsibility. Why I'm teaching you this is because we live in a world where people are imperfect. You are bound to get hurt this coming week also. Someone on the bus may tease you because you are a woman. The way you react is your responsibility. It's not theirs. They are responsible for their faults. But you are responsible for your response. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. So what others do may hurt you, but it is a responsibility to choose the right response based on the Bible. When we choose to judge, be angry and accuse, it hurts us more. But when we choose to forgive and let go and walk in agape love, that is the path of victory. That is called the King's way. Can you say the King's way? Hallelujah. So choose the King's way and you're choosing victory. You're choosing the abundant life. Can you say Amen?
Hallelujah. The abundant life that we receive by getting born again and being saved and the peace of God that we have in the Spirit, it will come out of us when we choose to walk in love towards others. Alright? So let's be reminded now what agape is. What is agape? Agape is God's immeasurable, incomparable love for mankind. It is a divine love that comes from God. Up on the screen, guys. Agape love is perfect, unconditional, sacrificial, and pure. A love that is displayed and seen on the cross through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And the Lord spoke to my heart that the King's way or the way of agape is the first position that the church and every believer must learn to take in the spirit. The spirit is the highway, not the low way. It's not in the valley, up in the mountains. All the Naga villages are built on top of the mountains. You know why? So that when the enemies came to take our heads, if you're on top of the mountain, it's the best position. It's the position of strength, right? We understand that. Now, bring that into the spirit. The high position where the enemy cannot destroy you, where the enemy cannot pull you down, where spiritual warfare against you is defeatable all the time is when you take the high position and the high position is called love love take your position in love can you say amen go to the next slide guys what is agape love agape love is a divine force it is unconditional next slide unconditional it is not based on anything we do or any failure on our part or any merits on our part is completely dependent on the nature of God himself amen God chooses to love us because he is love himself that's his very nature and the blessed truth is this how many of you believe in Jesus can I see your hands you are already in the love of God you're in it it's a spiritual location. You're already in the love of God. It's not by your works or by your goodness. You are in that love. It's by your faith in Christ. Can you say Amen? And the seal of that love, that seal, the confirmation of the love is the Holy Spirit in your heart. That the Holy Spirit which you already have is the seal that you are in the love of God. Can you say Amen? Come and lift up your hands and say this with me. God loves me today. He loves me right now. No matter what is happening in my life. No matter what I did. God loves me. Right now. And His love for me is without shame and condemnation. I am loved right now. Thank you, Father. Amen. Now believe that every day and now live from this love choose to give this love in every interaction with people the greatest two commandments love the Lord your God with all your heart is for your vertical relationship love your neighbor as yourself is for your horizontal relationship the two greatest commandments out of which will come the greatest blessings in your life the greatest strength in your life can you say hallelujah Position yourself in this love. Why is the king's way so important? Let's look at a few points right now. Number one. Because love is the meaning and purpose of our Christian walk. Love is the meaning and purpose of a Christian walk. The entire meaning of a Christian life is in this word, agape charity first Corinthians chapter 13 look at verses 1 to 3 though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not agape I have become a sounding brass or a clanging symbol and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains but have not agape I am nothing and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and though I give my body to be burned, but have not agape, it profits me 
nothing. Nothing. So Paul is saying, without agape, without love, all the knowledge in the world, the power in the world, the anointing in the world, profits you nothing. Amen. So greater than gifts and anointings and healings and blessings that we receive from God is now learning to walk in love. Learning to walk in agape. This is not only for pastors. This is not only for spiritual men and women. This is for every believer. Every believer. In Second, First Timothy chapter 1 verse 5. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 5. The Bible says, The goal and purpose of the Word of God is that we learn to love. The goal and purpose of the Word of God is that we learn to love to love the purpose of the commandment is that we love with a clear conscience the purpose of all the scriptures the purpose of all the discipleship class the purpose of everything we will learn in Christianity is ultimately that we will learn to love because love is the greatest commandment can you turn to your neighbor and say love is the greatest in fact in 1 John chapter 3, verse 14, I'm just reading scriptures to you today. 1 John 3, 14, the Bible says, He who does not love his brother abides in death. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Do you want to know the meaning of this? If you don't learn how to love, you are dying. If you do not learn how to love, you are dying. No, Pastor, I'm dying because you rejected me. No, Pastor, I'm dying because you ignored me. I'm dying because of what people did to me. No. What people did to you is not as powerful as agape. No matter what has happened in your life, it is not greater than love. If you will learn to turn the hurts and the trauma and the abuses of your life and just love people, by choice, you will start living. There are numerous, hundreds of testimonies of people who were in depression, suicidal. The pastor, instead of coming and telling them, Oh, oh it's okay, okay. Oh, you're suicidal. Don't give up. Instead of the pastor doing that, the pastor said, Stop thinking about yourself and go and feed the poor. Stop thinking about yourself and go and visit the poor and the sick and the needy. Stop wallowing in your misery. I'm telling you the truth. Stop being a victim. People have done this. People have done that. Victim mentality is killing you. It's not what happened that's killing you. It's your own mind that's killing you. Your own heart that's killing you. When we started the church, my name was Mud in Kohima. I was called Antichrist, Pastor, Lucifer, Pastor, Cult Leader. Almost every pulpit in Kohima was slandering me. I felt so hurt. My own ex pastor sent me a love letter saying, From today, you are expelled from church. So, it was a rose with thorns. <laughs> Valentine's Day rose. So, I was so hurt. So, when I would drive to Kohima, and I would just pass this church and that church, I'm like, because of this church, we're not going, because of this church, because of this pastor. And I started blaming and pointing fingers, and I had a victim mentality. That was killing me. What they said was not killing me. It's my own judgment of what they said. And because of them, because, of, because I am young, because I'm charismatic, because of my own judgment of the situation, it was killing me. So I decided one day when I realized my own thoughts are killing me. It's not the word. The words are not powerful enough. What they said in the pulpit is not powerful enough. God did not give them that authority. 
It's my own thoughts of what they said that is killing me. I decided I'm not a victim. I will never be a victim of circumstances. What people say, how people treat me. I'm going to reverse it. The way I fought is I started blessing them, praying for them, giving them gifts. I just started blessing them with my mouth, blessing them from the pulpit. And I just started praying for them. And that was a dam. A dam that broke free from my heart. A dam of love that was unconquerable. I'm not a victim. People may victimize me, but I'm not a victim. Amen. So you cannot think and feel like a victim. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. The way you come out of your misery is by loving others. No matter how much I pat you on the back, it will not help you. It will heal you, but the ultimate healing will come when you choose to give love, not when you receive love. Are you with me? So wives, love your husband. Even if they don't say anything good to you, for 20 years they have not said, I love you, you're beautiful, doesn't matter. Tomorrow morning say, you're handsome. Wives do the same. Husbands do the same. Listen, don't wait for the other ter- person to give. If you're always waiting for someone to give, that's a victim mindset. That's a very passive mindset. The way you come out of your misery, out of your death, out of your pain is by giving. By giving. Giving love. How many of you are depressed? Can I see your hands? Go feed the poor tomorrow. How many of you are sad? Go and visit someone tomorrow. If you're always expecting someone to come and bless you and visit you during Christmas, right? (laughs) You will always be sad. You know why? Because the very people you expect, they're not reading your minds. You know, they're not the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Sometimes some people get mad because I did not visit them. Because, Pastor, actually I was sick for two months. Did you call me and tell me? Did you tell him? No, I didn't tell anyone. I was hiding it, but I thought you knew. <laughs> I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm not the Holy Spirit, okay? So at times you just have to communicate and say, Pastor, I need. We will come. We run to people's homes when they call us, when they have needs. But we are not perfect. All right? So, he who does not love is dying. Number two, the way people will know we are Christians, John 13, verse 35. John 13, 35. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have agape for one another. Agape. Not human love, okay? Not tribal love. Okay? You're out, we're out. We love one another in the same church, but we don't like the other church because I'm not saying they don't like. I'm just using an example. Ayah. Ayah. My mouth also sometimes. (laughs) But that's many times, you know, we can be bonded because of human love. Right? We are bonded because of human love. But it's not if you have love for one another. It's not if you have eros, phileo, or storge love. It is because you have agape love for one another. That people will know that you are my disciples. So more than tribe and language and race, it should be agape love that holds the church together. Can you say amen? Some Christians pride themselves in the fact that they have a lot of scripture knowledge. They have a love for the truth, but they don't walk in love. The litmus test for your knowledge of scripture is love. It's not degrees. Some people are filled with the Holy Spirit, but still very judgmental. The litmus test that you are filled with the Spirit is when you have agape because the Holy Spirit is a spirit of love. Not condemnation and self-righteousness. Number three, agape. Everyone say agape. is a proof that you are abiding in God. 1 John 2, 10 to 11. 1 John 2, 10 to 11. 
He who loves his brother abides in the light. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. He who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness. Oh, I've seen this so many times. Don't think hate as that expressive, violent, head-taking, stabbing, murdering kind of hate. Even dislike for someone. Just from your mouth. Tut. Even if you don't say it, it was about to come out. Even that kind of feeling and thought is hate. When you enter your heart into any state of hatred, dislike, prejudice, racism, you are in darkness. What is, happens is that darkness comes into your heart. And it affects your choices, your decisions. It affects the way you see life. And it affects your life. Ultimately, that path will lead to destruction. But if you love, you are abiding in the light. I tell you, one of the best ways to clean your heart is called love. Love people. I have to always, in my heart, whenever I'm traveling outside of Nagaland, because it's naturally easy to love people who look like us, who talk like us, we are Nagas, we joke about our kuni, and we love one another. But when you go out and you are with people who are not like us, in mainland India, other parts of the world, who are different, who joke different, who smell different, I have to guard my heart and just always look from God's perspective. I love this person. I love this person. I love this person. Why? Because my heart is important to be guarded so that I say the right words. I make the right choices. I have the right attitude. And that opens doors, opens favor on my life. It's powerful. Love is powerful. So, if you love, you will abide in the light, which means you are abiding in God. If you have given your heart to any unforgiveness, anger, hatred, resentment, you are in darkness. You are in darkness. You can be a celebrity under all the spotlight of the world and still your heart be in darkness. Or you can be unknown to anyone, but you are in the light of God. I tell you, that is so much better. Number four, filled with the fullness of God. Ephesians 3, 19. How can I be filled with more of God? To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, which is beyond knowledge, the love of Christ. Hey, church, Christ loves you. Don't just know, believe. Say, Christ loves me. He died for me. He shed His blood for me. For me alone. Christ loves me. Amen. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. When you are meditating on how much God loves you, how much God loves you, how much God loves you, oh, your heart gets full and your life gets full of God. Full of God. Let me show you an example of this. Acts chapter 6 and 7. You don't have to turn there. But the Bible says in Acts chapter 6 that they chose seven men. Stephen was among them to be deacons and they chose deacons to serve. Stephen was full of faith and full of wisdom. Then in another part of the scripture it says, Stephen was full of the Spirit of God. Okay? So he was full of the Spirit, full of faith and full of wisdom. Acts chapter 7 verse 50. Acts chapter 7 verse 50. This is a powerful, powerful portion of scripture which we all need. Acts chapter 7 verse 50. Acts chapter 7 verse 50. The Bible says here that as Stephen was being stoned, all right, that looks very funny. Let me go to Acts chapter 7. I'm sorry, 60, not 50, 60. Forgive me, huh? <laughs> 60. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. People were stoning him. At the very moment when the stones were coming and hitting him and he was hurting, he was saying, Lord, forgive them. 
What is that? That is a person who is full of God. He was filled with the fullness of God. So that whatever the world threw at him could not hurt him. How did Stephen learn this? He learned it from his Savior. Jesus, when he was on the cross, he said, Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Amen. The king's way can make you so full of the love of God in your heart that you'll be like Stephen. When people hurl stones of gossip, stones of bad words, stones of accusation towards you, you can say, Father, forgive them. They just don't know what they are doing. I tell you, that's the best way to live life. Don't pick up the stone and throw back. <laughs> Do you know that Nagas, we are very, very capable of love? Amen. We are called for this. Number five. First John chapter 4, verse 12. It is the bond of unity for the church. First John 4, 12. If we love one another, the word love there is agapao, which is the verb of the agape. Verb. If we love one another, if, which is conditional. Sometimes some people just don't want to love. They're just too stubborn to love. Right? If we love one another, God abides in us. Ah. So, if husband and wife choose to give agape, God comes there. God abides in that marriage and that marriage becomes heaven on earth. That marriage becomes sweeter. If in the family, the father, the mother, the children, they decide to agape one another, unconditionally love one another, what happens? God comes in that marriage. Now, there will be always some people who may not want to love you, even your own family. Don't wait for them. You just choose to keep on walking in love. It will change the atmosphere in your home. Can you say Amen? If we love one another, I give you agape, you give me agape. We practice this. As imperfect as we may be, today we succeed, tomorrow we fail. Don't stop. Keep on practicing it. If we love one another, God abides in us. God, Elohim, Almighty God, comes, abides in the fellowship. And the presence of God brings that unity in the fellowship. And the Bible says, His love has been perfected, means completed and full grown, matured among us. See, the only way a marriage can be held together is love. The only way relationship with others can be held together is love. The only way a church can be held together is love. The unity of a church cannot be only doctrines. If you agree on this verse, I agree on this verse, let's come together, we form a denomination. But after one month, I disagree. And you also disagree. Let's break. If the unity of a church is based on agreement of scriptures, it is not strong enough. We must agree on the fundamentals, but it is not based only on agreement. It is based on agape love. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. It's the bond of unity in the church. Because agape gives us the ability to forgive one another, to walk in grace, despite our different ages, a church of different age groups, different status, some are rich, some are not so rich, right? Different genders, different educational standards, different languages. There's Hindi fellowship downstairs. Nagamis will come in the afternoon. A church of different races, ages, standards. How can we be bonded together? It's true agape. It's through love. The bond of unity in the church should be more than doctrine, language, denomination, or even the vision of the church. It must be an unconditional love towards one another. 
to believe that God put me in this place. God brought me to this place. God brought me to this church. Not only to be blessed, not only to be healed, delivered, not only to take blessings, but to grow in love. I really want to encourage you to consider becoming a member of this church. It's not for the desire that we just want to grow the church. No. It's a commitment that I, I belong here. Because I, I sense the Spirit of God is saying that I belong here, I'm a part here, I'm growing here. Now, as you grow, you're not only meant to be taking, but also contributing, right? If you become 30 years old, you want to contribute to the chick, to, not to the chicken, the kitchen of your father, <laughs> not the chicken. <laughs> yeah, contribute chicken to the kitchen, all right? <laughs> when you're 30 years old, and you're still taking pocket money from your father and mother, in your heart also you know it's not right. Yes or no? You don't feel right. And you're 40 years old, and you're still taking pocket money from your father. God bless you. May God give you revelation. You want to start contributing to the family you belong. Amen. So what I'm saying is don't just come to this church to take but contribute. If you have been blessed, contribute. Contribute by your, we're all doing it through our giving and our offering, but beyond that, contribute by your talents, your gifts. We need people on the media. We need people up here on the stage playing music. We need so many people. Just because our Sunday services run well doesn't mean that we don't need people. We need more people. We need people who can write. We need people who can do lights. So contribute. Because that will add to the growth and the blessing. And through that, we can do so much more. Amen. But it must come out of your love, your willingness. Don't get manipulated by me saying, I felt so guilty when you said that. Don't act out of guilt. Can you say amen? Act out of the freedom of your And even if you don't want to do anything to contribute and want to come for the rest of your life, keep on coming. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. I may not show up for your funeral, but you're welcome to come every Sunday. You're free to act out of agape love, not out of guilt. Can you say amen? All right. Last verse 6. Point is, the proof that we love God is agape. 1 John 2, 5. Whoever keeps his word to love, truly the love of God is perfected, matured, complete in him. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever keeps his word, his commandment is love. So when you keep that word, truly, you have grown and matured. So the proof that you love God is when you walk in love towards others. Not how much you cry, but how much you love. Amen. Before we end, let me just go to 1 Corinthians 13 again, up on the slide. This is from the Amplified Version. Let's remind ourselves what God's love looks like. Because it's more than a feeling. It's more than an emotion. It's very practical. And the Bible also lists it out for us. This is from the Amplified. Position yourself in this, alright? Love endures long and is patient and kind. Love endures endures long that means a long suffering love is long suffering is patient and kind 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 okay that means even learning manners to say kind words not rude words it's love love never is envious no boils over with jealousy is not boastful or vainglorious. Love is not boastful. Love doesn't get jealous. If you see someone wearing a better dress than, than you, go up and tell, you look wonderful. If you see someone get a job and you did not, go and tell them, I celebrate your blessing. Go and congratulate them, bless them, pray for them. Okay? 
it does not display itself haughtily. That means love does not seek its own attention. It is not conceited, arrogant, and wanted, does not display itself haughtily. Let me just look at it from my own iPad here. Does not display itself haughtily. It is not conceited arrogant and inflated with pride it is not rude 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 that means love says please love says thank you even please and thank you is love walking in love that means after the service is over and you're blessed coming in front and say thank you pastor for your word that's walking in love. <laughs> or any guest speaker. Don't just get blessed and then run out of the building. Just learning to appreciate people is called love. See, why I need to highlight this is because many of us, we depend on emotions only. We are not doing this by choice. We are depending on emotions. So when you're deeply touched, ay, ay, you know, Pastor Kiko, ay, ay, ay. But when your emotion was not moved, we don't practice it. We must practice this by choice. Agape is not a feeling, it's a choice. Can you say amen? So love is not rude, unmannerly, and does not act unbecomingly. Don't just walk in huff and puff, bang doors, talk, 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 talk. Some husbands know what I'm talking about. The rest of you are just looking at me. Yeah, one day you'll know. <laughs> Banging doors behind, whatever. Love. God's love in us does not insist on His own rights or its own way. For it is not self-seeking. It is not touchy, touchy, touchy always offended so easily offended always angry with people we had a sister some years back many many years back i saw her that she wasn't coming to church for some time so i asked her is anything wrong and she said yeah so many people are taking bad things about me i was like what i know i asked how do you know do you have any evidence did you hear no no but i know so many people in church are talking bad things about me. So I said, how do you know? Because I saw those two group of sisters in the corner, they were laughing. They were looking towards my direction and they were smiling. But were they talking about you? She had no evidence. But she was touchy. And she got offended. Some people are like that. You see? And it's because you have been hurt in your life. We you understand that. But now understand that that's not the way to live life. Love is not touchy or fretful or resentful. It takes no account of the evil done to it. So love does not keep a record of wrongs. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. It does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness, but rejoices when right and truth prevail. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes. This is what I wanted to highlight today lack of time we cannot love is ever ready to believe the best of every person this is very important this is such a skill for life in your job in your school in your marriage as a leader it's going to help you in church to be a member to serve together as volunteer love believes the best of the other person love believes the best of people not the worst to walk in love means you must choose to change your mindset and believe the best of others. I'm going to give you the skill. Maybe I'll just take 10 minutes to share this. Okay? Now, if I chose out of three persons to be a leader, I chose one candidate. The other two felt rejected. The example from the beginning. All right? Now, those two can respond by thinking and assuming, pastor does not like me. Pastor doesn't want to highlight my gift. Pastor must have something against my tribe. Those thoughts come. Yes or no? It comes. Somebody did not invite you to birthday party. You start thinking they don't like me. Yes or no? That thinking is called believing the worst of the other person. 
বুঝি আছে না গামিছে কই দিব লাগে না নাই দ্যাট থিঙ্কিং দিস ইজ ইম্পর্টেন্ট বিকজ দিস ইজ দ্য এরিয়া ওয়ে দ্য সেটন ডিফিটস ইউ এভরি ডে দিস ইজ স্পিরিচুয়াল ওয়ারফেয়ার সি when you assume he doesn't like me he is rejecting me without any evidence you are believing the worst of that person okay or you can respond in the right attitude and say praise god maybe it was not my time maybe it was not god's will for me right now praise god i'm just going to wait on the lord that's believing the best of me when your wife forgot to return your call Don't believe the worst. Eh, make disrespect to you though. Right? See, what you believe about the situation will determine how strong your fight will be. And that's where hurts come. Believe the best. Believe the best of people not the worst. For example, if you see someone wearing short skirts and a lot of makeup, don't assume that they are loose. Immoral. and trying to attract guys especially even leaders church leaders don't think that way to think that way you're believing the worst of that person you're not walking in love the dressing standards of my generation and gen z are different because a lot of people have been hurt by church leaders accusing and condemning them just because they wore a short skirt to church Now we can just lovingly explain to them teach them and they will grow in time but to immediately come to a conclusion is not love it is believing the worst of those people and it causes hurts condemnation even though you may not say it in the spirit it, it the, the people catch it Are you following me When someone walks by you hurriedly without saying hello properly it happens a lot right I've done that a lot of times. Don't assume that they don't like me. Don't assume. Hey, Pastor Kali, powerful man, look at the kota koido. Officer Kano, the kota koido. Amikan manu do ta hisab ni do. People think like that in Nagaland. Your thinking is hurting you, not me. Ha ha ha. I'm free. Your thinking is hurting you, not me. Tu ni jor bhab na brat tu ke murai asde. You may never know that he is very busy he is rushing to keep an appointment you may never know there's an emergency that they are rushing to but by your false judgment because you are judging the situation he doesn't like me they only talk to rich people by your judging of the situation what are you doing you are believing the worst A lot of people in Nagaland, even a lot of YouTube videos right now, and you go and see about Ishwar Kwaze Church money leaders, and all, all of them are just assumptions. People are just speaking out of their ugly feelings, and not the truth of God. Don't listen to such videos. So about the church leaders can Kali power man go on every day. How do you know? Do you know all the leaders in Nagaland? But they are assuming based on one or two hurts and that is actually bringing division in the church. See, you are hurt because of your imaginary hurt. So, don't assume. Believe the best. Believe the best means okay. I'm not going to jump to conclusions. I'm just going to believe the best. Maybe he had some other things to do. It's not because he doesn't like me. It's just because they were busy. Just believe the best. Don't believe the worst, all right? When someone forgot to call you back, believing the worst means you start imagining why is he so proud? Mugi hisab ni dena gi. Did I do something wrong? This is a very common conclusion. Did I do something wrong? Did I do something wrong? When someone did not invite you for the birthday, did I do something wrong? Mo ki ba golti ko isna ki pastor. Tu mo ki reject ko ese. Mo ki ba golti ko isna ki. No, ki golti ko na ai. Mo i het tu ki baba na ai. I am not perfect. 
Sometimes people make mistakes. Believing the best may believing the best is this. He may have something going on in his life, so I'm just going to give the benefit of the doubt. Believing the best is it's okay. People make mistakes. Right? So just give you these points. How to believe the best? Don't jump to conclusions immediately. The immediate conclusion of your feelings, don't jump to that. All right, number two, be have see positive intentions. Intentions. Sometimes when pastors call and say, hey, I didn't see you in church for three Sundays, so what's happening in your life? Don't think, why is pastor so nosy about my personal life? No, we're not nosy, we just love you. So, see positive intentions, not negative intentions. All right, number three, give benefit of doubt to people. Number four, see them as God would see them. Peter was weak, but Jesus saw him as a rock. Peter was very weak, like a reed, but Jesus said, you are a rock. See them the way God sees them. Number five, see the gifts and the abilities and potential, not the failures. Don't see the addictions. When you see someone struggling with addiction, see God's potential in them and speak into that. Encourage that. That's how we believe the best in people. Amen. Are you all blessed today? Hallelujah. I believe that you have been blessed by the Word of God. If you have any testimonies or prayer requests any time of the day, you can contact or email us at the information given down below. And if this message has blessed you, we encourage you to please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Thank you and God bless you.